understand, but uh, hopefully at the, after the message, it will be okay, your network. Uh, <clears throat> today's topic is uh, the law of Moses versus the law of Christ. I'm sure many of us uh, may not have been very familiar with the law of Christ. We're all very familiar with the law of Moses. The Old Testament law is summed up uh, by Jesus in two commandments. And in the Old Testament time, uh, God gave first the Ten Commandments to Moses at Mount Horeb, Sinai, for ten, ten Commandments. And thereafter, he added many other commandments. There are altogether 613 commandments in the Old Testament, 613 commandments. And uh, that's what we refer to as the law of Moses, the law of God in the Old Testament. Before the law was given, there was sin already in the world. When man sinned against God, when he disobeyed God, he came under the devil's control. He was cut off from God. And the sin entered the world. And death came because of sin. Romans 5.12 says, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. In this way, death came to all people because all people sinned. And at that time, uh, in the Garden of Eden, when man was cut off from God, since that time, man had gone his own way, cut off from God. And God's ways and man's ways are different. God's thoughts and man's thoughts are different. The Old Testament law was given only about 430 years after Abraham. When the Israelites came from Egypt, at Mount Sinai, God gave most of the Ten Commandments. But before that, the requirements of God were in the hearts of people. For example, the Bible says about Abraham in the book of Genesis, 26 chapter verse 5, God testifies about Abraham. He obeyed me and kept my commandments, decrees, requirements, and laws of God. He kept the requirements of God, the laws of God. <coughs> Where were the law those days? The law of God was in the heart of Abraham. In other words, even before the law was given, sincere people knew what pleases God and what does not please God. And Abraham was God's friend. James 2.23 talks about Abraham being God's friend. And therefore, uh, being a friend of God, somehow he knew what pleases God and what does not please God. And he obeyed God kept the requirements, commands, decrees, and laws of God. Only 430 years later, the Old Testament law was given through the intermediate of angels to Moses. And very often I share this with you, that before the law was given to the Israelites, when Moses went up the Mount of Sinai to worship God, actually went up the Mount to worship God, because before he went to Egypt, God told him, when you bring my people out, you shall worship me on this mountain. So he kept the, 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 the Israelites were required to be in the plains. Moses went up the Mount Horeb, it's actually in Saudi Arabia, to worship God. And God sent him back with a message. Exodus 19, chapter 4, 5, 6. You yourself know what I did to Egypt how I carried eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, out of all the nations will be my treasured possession. Treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be from a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is respond by saying in verse 8 of Exodus 19 chapter, we'll obey everything the Lord tells us to do. Only when they told Moses, we'll obey everything what God says, God gave them the commandments. They were required to obey the commandments. In so doing, they would be blessed. There were blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. In fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, 27 chapter, verse 26, we read, Cursed be any man does not continue doing what is in the book of the law. 
If you don't keep on, if you don't keep uh, obeying the law, you are under a curse. So the law was conditional. Blessings were conditional. That's the law of Moses. Rules and regulations. And of course, before they enter the land of Canaan, God told them through Moses, observe carefully all these commandments. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 6. For this will show your wisdom among the nations who have the decrees and say, surely you get nations wise and understanding people. So through their obedience, other nations are supposed to know that these people are wise people and understanding people. Also, as they obeyed the word of God, 11th chapter of Deuteronomy verse 8 says, they will have strength to go and occupy the land. Strength and wisdom were offshoots of obedience to the Old Testament law for the Israelites. And again, conditional obedience, conditional blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. The law was given primarily for them to understand they need a savior. They need a savior. And the entire law actually points to Christ, the savior. After the law was given, whenever they failed to obey God, God sent the prophets to bring people back to a relationship with God. The law was given, they required to obey the law. When they obeyed the law, they were blessed. When they're blessed, they became proud, they went away, they got the problem, they cried out to God, God sent prophets, prophets warned them not to continue in sin. When they obeyed the prophet, they were restored back to God. There's a certain pattern we see. Obedience, blessings, pride, going, going away from God, getting into problems, crying out to God, God sending prophets, and prophets bringing them back to a relationship with God. It's a roller coaster spiritual life they had those days. <clears throat> and therefore, as a certain pattern in the Old Testament time. But then, the law was given primarily for them to understand they cannot keep the law. The law points to the Messiah. And the prophets also point to the Messiah. In Acts 10, 43, when Peter testifies the of Cornelius, he says, all the prophets testify about him. So everyone who believes in receive forgiveness of sins through his name. Everyone who believes in him receive forgiveness of sins through his name. And the Old Testament law actually points to Christ. It testifies to Christ. In 1 John chapter 5, 11, 12, 13. This is a testimony. God has given us eternal life. This life is in a son. He who has the son has life. He does not have son of God, does not have life. Now this law was given for people to understand they can't keep the law. The law of Moses actually brought death, separation from God. It's confirmed in the New Testament. Second Corinthians, third chapter, verse seven says, the law only condemns men. It brought only death. Because through the law, we can understand we are sinners and we are cut off from God. It brought death separation from God. The Old Testament law never saved anybody. But then it's holy, given by God, and it points to Christ. Not only that, when the law was about to be given to them at Mount Horeb, when the Israelites approached, approached the Mount of Sinai, God came up on the mountain in fire. Exodus 19 chapter was 18 says, and fire came upon that mountain. And the Israelites stay at a distance. They don't come near. They tell Moses, Moses, you speak to us and we will listen. Don't have God speak to us. If God speaks to us, we will die. Exodus 20 chapter verse 19. And Moses says, don't be afraid. God has come to test you. That the fear of God will be in you to keep from sinning. Don't be afraid, but have fear. 
They said, you don't, you speak to, don't have God speak to us. If God speaks to us, we will die. Now, God remembered that. And later on, you'll find the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy, verse 15, Moses tells the Israelites before they enter the land of Canaan, the Lord your God raised up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to him. For this word I asked of the Lord on that day at Horeb. They told Moses, Moses, you speak, we will listen. Don't have God speak to us. We will, we will die if God speaks to us. God remembered that. And through Moses, he told them, to Deuteronomy 18, chapter 15, God will go raise up for you, prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to him. That prophet was to bring the law that sets mankind free, the law of Christ. That prophet was the Christ. How do you know that? I'll come a little later. So, Moses spoke about another prophet who will come. The prophet. Not a prophet, the prophet. And he told his lies. You must listen to him. At Horeb, he said, don't have God speak to you. You speak to us. Moses will listen. God remembered that. He will raise one more prophet for you. You must listen to this prophet. So much so, when actually John the Baptist came, in John chapter 1, 19 onwards, he says, he openly testifies, I am not the Christ. He testified, I am not the Christ. Don't think I am the Christ. Then they asked him, are you John the Baptist? He says, no. Are you, I'm sorry, are you Elijah? He says, no. They are asking John the, John the Baptist, are you Elijah? He says, no. Are you the prophet? He says, no. Are you the prophet? The prophet spoken of by Moses. Which actually is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But this prophet will speak words of freedom that sets mankind free. The law of Moses never set anybody free. It brought death. It brought condemnation. But then God spoke through Moses about another prophet. So much so, John the Baptist says, I'm not the prophet. I'm not Elijah. I'm not the Christ. But then they were all waiting for the prophet to come. They were waiting for the Messiah to come. They were waiting for Elijah to come. And they were waiting for the prophet to come. So much so, some people recognize that this prophet actually is Jesus. For example, after he fed more than 5,000 people with five of bread and two fish, in John 6, 14, they say, surely this is the prophet. This is a prophet spoken of by Moses. Then, at the Feast of Tabernacles, when he spoke in a loud voice on the last day, when they heard him speak, again they said, John 7, chapter verse 40. Surely this is a prophet. This is the prophet spoken of by Moses. In Deuteronomy 18, chapter verse 15. So this prophet will speak words of freedom that sets mankind completely free. The law of Christ sets people free. The law of Moses bound people under bondage and under death. Yet, the law of Moses points to Christ. That's why you find when the Lord entered the world in flesh and blood, he told the Jews in John 5, 39, you didn't really study scriptures because think by them you have eternal life. These scriptures testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. In John 5, 45, he tells them, do not think I'll accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believe Moses, you believe me, for Moses wrote about me. If you don't believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? Moses wrote about Jesus, the prophet, in Deuteronomy 18:15. And these Jews will depending upon the law of Moses. You think by them eternal life? 
scriptures? Yes, these scriptures testify about me. I won't accuse you before the Father. The accuser is Moses on whom you hope such set. If you believe Moses, you believe me. Moses wrote about me. So the whole testament points to Christ and the law that sets mankind free. This law of Christ is spoken of in the New Testament in three occasions, three places. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Carry each other's burdens. This way you'll fulfill the law of Christ. Law of Christ. In the book of James, chapter 1, from verse 22, is written. Don't listen to the word of God. Do what it says. If you listen to the word of God, listen to what it says. Till a man looks at a face in a mirror and goes away and forgets what it looks like. But the man looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues doing it, not forgetting what is heard. He'd be blessed in what he does. Perfect law that gives freedom. That is the law of Christ. By that law, by the teachings of Jesus, we have been set free. No more bondage to sin, set free from the devil, set free from sin. A third place where the law of Christ is spoken of is James chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. But James writes, speak and act as those who have been going to be judged by the perfect law that gives freedom. For judgment without mercy be shown to those who are not merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The law of Christ cries out for mercy. As compared to the blood of Abel that cries out for revenge, blood of Christ cries out for mercy. It speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, the blood of Christ. <clears throat> so the Old Testament law only bound people. In fact, in the New Testament, you'll read in the book of Galatians, in chapter 3, 24 onwards, 20, 20, 20, 25 onwards, to 25, the law was given to lead us to Christ, to point to Christ. The law points to Christ. Since you come to believe in Christ, you are no longer under the supervision of the law. Now, this fact of the prophet coming and speaking words of edification, words of freedom, words of grace was known to the prophets in the Old Testament time. These prophets who spoke about the coming of the Messiah in 1 Peter chapter 1, from verse 10, we read, concerning the salvation, the prophet who spoke of the grace to others that was come to you, searched intently with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to the Spirit of Christ and then was pointing, they spoke of the of Christ and the goal that would follow. To reveal to them they are not serving themselves. These prophets wrote the scriptures by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They read what they wrote and they were amazed. When is the Messiah going to come? When is this prophet going to come? Prophet spoken of by Moses in Deuteronomy 18.15. They long for his coming. So much so when Jesus entered the world, he told his own disciples, 13th chapter of Matthew, 16, 17. Blessed are eyes because they see, ears because they hear. For many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, they didn't see it. They long to hear what you hear, they didn't hear it. The Lord spoke gracious words. Luke 4, 22. He spoke words of authority. Luke 4, 32. He spoke words of Freedom that sets mankind totally free from the devil and from sin. So the law of Christ has set us free. We are now set free. We are no longer under the devil's control and therefore we have to be a people who live and act as we will be judged by the law that gives freedom. Now the Old Testament, I told you, had first 10 commandments at Sinai. Then 603 commandments, total 613. And they're all summed up by Micah. Micah chapter 6, verse 8, in three commandments. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And subsequently, 
when Christ entered the world in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, he summed up the entire Old Testament laws into two laws. Number one, love your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And number two, love your neighbor as yourself. Then came the law of Christ. He added something else. He told the people living, listening to him at the, during the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 43, 44. You heard what he said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. This kind of commandment sets us free. Loving enemies is a wonderful thing to do. Because Jesus commanded that. And what is commanded us to do? He will enable us to do it by the strength he gives us. Those whom he calls, he justifies. Romans 8.30 says, those whom he called, he justified. If he's called us to love enemies, he will justify the calling by giving us the strength to do it. So we have come to a point today where we are now constrained to obey the perfect law that gives freedom. Perfect law. So we don't let, we listen to God's word, we do what it says. Look, intent in the perfect law that gives freedom and continues doing it. Then we breast in whatever we do. We are constrained to obey the teachings of Jesus. That's why in John 14, 23, Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. Is the Old Testament law obsolete? The Old Testament law has three kinds. Moral laws, ritualistic laws, and sacrificial laws. Moral laws are still valid. The God is still a moral God. Sacrificial laws are all fulfilled already by Christ on the cross. No more valid. And as far as the ritualistic laws are concerned, many of them are obsolete. Therefore, we have to correctly divide the word of truth. Discern the teaching. Correctly divide the word of truth. That's why in 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul exhorted Timothy. Do your best to present yourself to God as one of truth. Workman doesn't need to be ashamed. Correctly devise the word of truth. You must know what is for the Old Testament time. What is the New Testament time? What is the perfect word that gives freedom today? For example, when you read the Old Testament, the Psalms, for example, many Christians say, I can identify with the psalmist, especially when the psalmist says, punish him, kill him, finish him off. Psalmist did in the Old Testament time because the Old Testament law, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, Someone said the right cheek, show him the other cheek. Jesus said that. What does is not like that? What does happen was eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. So today when, it, when we discern the Old Testament teaching, we should understand the law of Moses was at that point of time. We are today governed by the law of Christ that sets people free. And therefore we don't pray for the destruction of enemies. We pray for their well-being. We bless those who persecute us. We bless and do not curse them. In 1 Corinthians 4, chapter 12 and 13, Paul writes, When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. That's the law we are supposed to follow today. The perfect law that gives freedom. Not Old Testament law of punishment, of destruction of our enemies. Even the Old Testament time, read about how God was so pleased with Solomon for his prayer request. God asked Solomon, what do you want me to give you? Solomon says, I want a discerning heart to govern your people. First Kings chapter 3, from verse 9 we read, God was pleased Solomon asked for this. And the Lord tells him, he did not ask for long life or wealth or death of enemies. 
I'll give you what you ask. I think we did not. I will give you what you did not ask. In the Old Testament time, nothing wrong in asking God for death of enemies. If Solomon had to ask, nothing wrong because eye for eye, tooth for a tooth. But Solomon pleased God by not asking for death of enemies. Somehow he knew the heart of God is not to punish enemies. God doesn't let delight punish in wicked people. So today we must understand we are constrained to obey the perfect law that gives freedom. That's why in James 2.12 written, speak and act are those, are those going to be judged by the perfect law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to those who are not merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So today, we are called to be merciful towards people, forgiving towards people, forgiving even enemies, loving even enemies. There's a desperate need today from the part of the church to discern the correct teaching to be followed in today's context. To obey the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they are not burdensome. We look at 1 John chapter 5, 3, 4, and 5. 1 John chapter 5, 3, 4, and 5. John writes, This is love for God to obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. Is the victory overcomes the world? Even our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? He believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So today, when we follow the teachings of Jesus and choose to love enemies, he will give us the resources to love enemies. This love is a love in the spirit. Christian chapter 1 verse 8. Every teaching that Jesus gave us, we are called to follow today. That's the perfect law that gives freedom. The Old Testament law never brought freedom. It only brought death. It brought condemnation. But that Old Testament law came with glory. If you look at 2 Corinthians 3rd chapter, from verse 7, the ministry that condemns men came with glory. The people could not look at the face of Moses, radiant face of Moses. All the glory was fading where they could not look at his face. If that ministry came with glory that brought death, how much more glorious the ministry that brings righteousness. This ministry of New Testament sharing gospel is the ministry that brings righteousness. That's why we shouldn't be shy to communicate the gospel. This ministry brings righteousness. How glorious this is that brings righteousness. When we share Christ to people, we bring righteousness to them. So why you feel shy about bringing righteousness to people? Christ is the righteousness. And therefore, today, let's understand that Jesus has set us free from sin, from devil's control. We are so free today, we can use the freedom to either obey God or disobey God. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul writes, Freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and don't let, be, let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. <clears throat> Christ has set us free from the devil, from sin, and we can now enjoy the kingdom of God. We can choose to enjoy the kingdom of God. If we are wise people, we will seek his kingdom's resources of power to obey the Lord. Because 1 Corinthians 4.20 says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Power to say no to temptation. Power to say no to sin. In that process, we manifest the peace and the joy of the Lord. And we manifest the kingdom of God. Romans 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Let's make no bones about it. We are constrained to obey the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ today. <clears throat> and he gave the commandment to love. 
to love even enemies. Usually people sum up the entire Old Testament law into two commands. Love God, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbors yourself. They don't talk about enemies. Jesus qualified that. I say unto you, love your enemies. How many of us take that to heart? We don't think enemies deserve our love. We were enemies of God. He loved us. Colossians 1.21 says, we were enemies of God in our, in our minds, in our evil behavior. But he loved us. And since he loves us, while we're enemies, he says, love enemies. And to, for us to do that, he gives us the resources we need. 2 Timothy 1.3 says, sorry, 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. That's why Christian life today, or rather obedience to Jesus' teachings today, is not a burden. How many Christians today think it's a very, very burden to obey the teachings of Jesus? Oh, so difficult to obey the teachings of Jesus. In this wicked world, we cannot do it. God is the most practical God. When he calls us to obey him, he justifies the calling by giving us the resources we need. So we seek the resources. His divine power has given us everything we need. He gives us his word that sanctifies us. John 17, chapter 17. He's given us the Holy Spirit who is a sanctifier. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 says, we are chosen by the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. As we live by the word and live by the Spirit, our faith increases and by faith we obey God joyfully. By faith, we obey the teaching of Jesus joyfully. Going back to 1 John, 5th chapter, 3, 4, and 5. This is love for God, to obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdens. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is victory overcomes the world, even our faith. Who then overcomes the world? He believes Jesus is the Son of God. Now, there are many people, even the other day I was sharing with you also, I heard on. Assurance of Salvation on Tuesday, even now so many people have this question about will I lose my salvation? What if I keep on sinning after accepting Christ? So why do you want to keep on thinking about sinning? Think about how to please God. Why do you want to deliberately keep on sinning? Why think of sinning? Why not think of how to please God? In 1 Thessalonians 4 chapter verse 1, Paul writes, Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live to please God. As in fact, you are living. Now we ask you and urge you to do this more and more. I don't understand why Christians only think about what if I keep on sinning? Why even think about sinning? Well, how about think about how can I please you, Lord? I want to please you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Therefore, I want to please you, Lord. When our minds are focused on pleasing God, we won't even think about losing salvation. Simply because God has promised that as a gift for us. We have been set free. We belong to Jesus. Bought by his blood. Oh, look at the beautiful worship going on in heaven, which John saw in a vision. Revelation chapter 5, 9 and 10. He saw the 24 elders, the four living creatures, worshipping Jesus as the Lamb of God takes the scroll from the hand of the one sitting on the throne. And they sing the song together. You are slain and by your blood, in first they say, you were to take the scroll and open the seals. For you were slain and by your blood, you purchase men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Make them with kingdom and priest to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. We have been bought by his blood. He was slain, and by his blood he purchased men for God. We are the purchase of God, bought by his blood. Having bought by his blood, will he sell us for a higher price? No way. 
since we belong to him now, let's focus on fulfilling the perfect law that gives freedom, the law of Christ. He set, he set us free completely on the cross. Galatians 5.16 talks about living by the Spirit. Peter speaks about living, uh, 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 living, uh, living as free men. Paul talks about, speaks about living as free men. We have been set free. So thank God for this amazing work of Christ on the cross. By that blood, we've been set free from devil's control, from sin, and we belong to Jesus and no one can snatch us out of his hands. In John chapter 10, 27, 28, we read, Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hands. He goes on to say, My father greater than all. No one can snatch them out of his hands. Just in case we think the hands of these are not sufficient to keep us secure, we are in the hands of the father and none of us can be snatched out of his hands. So I want to remind all of us who have the slight doubt about losing salvation, remember this freedom we have been given. Set free from the devil, set free from sin, and we choose to live a life that pleases God, and to please God is given resources. He is a helper today. Hebrews 2.18 Because he himself suffered while being tempted, he is able to help those being tempted. He is a helper in facing temptations. He is a faithful God. 1 Corinthians 10.13 God is faithful. He will have a lot of his tested more than you can bear. With every temptation, the way out, I can stand up under it. And the word used for temptation, there is also a word uh, used as, uh, it means test. The Greek word is pyrasmos. It could be test or temptation, both. It could either be test or temptation. Either way, God is a faithful God. Give the strength to face the test and temptation and come out successfully. Because he draws us out of sin. Thank God for the amazing work of Christ on the cross. That is why today the cross must be our boast. The last two weeks we'll be looking at, uh, I finished on Tuesday, the 10th session on the legacy of the cross. I wish you can go back and listen to this message again and again. The legacy of the cross, 10 legacy aspects of legacy. And when you understand that, the cross will be our boast. Galatians 6.14, Paul writes, May I never boast except on the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world is crucified to be, and I have been crucified to the world. The only boasting we are called to do is about Jesus. Only boasting. Old Testament time, Jeremiah chapter 9, 20-24. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, the strong man of his strength, rich man of riches. Let him boast, boast about this. He understands and knows me. Ram the Lord and exercises kindness, justice and righteousness for these are delight. New Testament, 1 Corinthians 1.31 Let him boast, boast in the Lord. So the law of Moses only brought death. Made us aware we are sinners. 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 56 The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. The law of Moses. The law of Moses had power because it made us understand we are sinners and Death struck us because of sin. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, law of Moses. But the law of Christ set us free. Sin has no power over us. We've been set free. So thank God for his amazing law, the law of Christ. I told three places the law of Christ is mentioned. Go back and read it. James 2, 12. Galatians 6 2 and James 1 25. Three passages talks about the perfect law that gives freedom. 
the word perfect, by the way, the word perfection in, in Greek, it also means completion. Completion. Perfection means complete. Christ's teachings makes us complete. He didn't come to abolish the law. He fulfilled it. He is our righteousness. In him we have righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to become sin for us. That in him we might become the righteousness of God. In Christ we have become the righteousness of God. So praise and thank God for his amazing grace. There's no limit to this grace. And the more we receive grace, the more we realize how much more grace we can receive. By receiving grace, we rise above every situation in life. Romans 5.17 says, If by the trespass of one man, death reigned to that one man, how much more then will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Christ Jesus. We think of grace only in the context of salvation, isn't it? For every aspect of Christian life, we need grace. Grace to reign in life. Romans 8.32 says, He did not spare his own son, but gave him a press. Holding along with the son, graciously give us all things. And therefore, as we open our hearts and minds to his grace, let's not be complacent about the grace we received. Let's ask him for more and more grace to be able to use that grace to live a life that pleases him. So don't think of sinning. Think of pleasing God. When you're constantly obsessed about pleasing God, there's no time to worry about, will I lose my salvation? Will my faith last till the very end? He, the author and perfecter of our faith. Hebrews 12, 2. We all have a measure of faith which has given us. 12, Romans 12, 3. He draws us out of sin, Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, he will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. So thank God for this amazing grace. There's no limit to grace. And we are no longer under the supervision of the Old Testament law. Since Christ has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. We are bound, constrained, to obey the teachings of Jesus, the perfect law that gives freedom. I like all of us go to rise and let this word go deep into hearts. <coughs> and I'm going to pray. We'll be able to really obey the teachings of Jesus and find it a joyful experience, not a burden at all. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Not the law of Moses today, the law of Christ that sets us free. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Master. Let's pray. Heaven Father, thank you, each and every one of us on Zoom, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the perfect Lord, gives us freedom, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that what you called us to do, Lord, will enable us to do it, Lord, because you've given us everything we need for life and godliness, Lord. Help us think how to please you, Lord. Not to think of disobeying you, but how to please you. How to please you more and more, Lord. To find out what pleases God. To know your will, Lord, and do your will, Lord. Give us your wisdom. Give us your strength. Give us every resource we need, Lord. Deliver life that pleases you, Lord, and be a blessing to others. Help us boast of the cross, Lord. And Lord, I thank you, Master, even as there are people nowadays, Lord, wondering what's, what, is, what is Easter, what is Good Friday, and there are people who do not know these things, Lord. Help us be faithful to the gospel, Lord. Lift up your name, Lord. Pray for each one of us, Lord. We'll understand the perfect, Lord, the good freedom, Lord, and realize, Lord, the law of Moses done his duty to point us to Christ. Now we're under Christ, Lord. We're no longer in the supervision of the Lord. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.